Yeah. So, so yeah. What, what have you come over for? Well, to do this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've come over when to do you, this. When are you going back? Uh, I'm going back kind of like a week from now because I'm going to go visit my cousin who lives in York. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, and I'll go to, you know, go to some... It's a privilege for us to have you, then. It's a privilege for me to be here. This is great. I, uh, you know, I didn't uh, plan specifically to be here during the Olympics, yeah. but uh, that's how it but worked you, out, so... You're a highly awarded comedian, aren't you? Uh, I've won some awards, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, but I wouldn't say highly awarded, no, awarded. Not, that's sort of that impression that you get, is that you're highly awarded, and then I was <laughs> watching your stuff, um, obviously, but then I stopped watching it because I didn't want to watch anything that might be on tonight. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's nice to sit fresh, but one of the things that came across in that short time mm -hmm. was... I thought an interest in people. Mm hmm Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like that I have an interest yeah. in people? Absolutely I do, yeah. yeah. And um uh that's why coming to a place like London is really, really exciting because there's people all descriptions all the time. Yeah. Uh it's very like it's a very exciting place to be because uh just to see people getting along in such a like busy kind of place and everybody here seems to be doing it very effortlessly it's amazing like I, maybe it doesn't seem like it living in it but as an outsider it seems like everything's a very well-oiled machine here so yeah it's it's this is a great place to be people watching london is uh london's got it. i was thinking that yeah my journey over here because there were so many interesting things to look at. Yes, yeah. You're never bored even for a second because, uh, yeah, there's like all descriptions of people and speaking all different languages and, uh, yeah, it's exciting that way. But then I was thinking, what do you find funny? Not what do you make funny, but what do you find funny? You know what? I find really, really base kind of dumb things funny. Like I find, you know, YouTube clips of somebody falling off of a thing or, yeah, I don't know why, but one of the funniest things to me is somebody who's tried to make like a cake or a pie and it's turned out horribly. That always makes me laugh and has since I was a little kid. If somebody tried to make something and it doesn't look at all like the thing they were trying to make, I will laugh for hours at that. I don't know why. <laughs> but this like does my head in though because that's not how you make people laugh. No, I know, and that's, that's like, how isn't it crazy? Do that? Yeah, it is. how? <laughs> I have no idea. Can you explain how you do it? I don't know. That's the thing. Like I, um, yeah, my the stuff that's always made me laugh is not necessarily the stuff that I'm able to conjure up. You know yeah. what I mean? Like. The things that I think, I think they're funny, but the stuff that makes me like double over is the very, very dumb stuff. And I can't, I mean, I, nobody can pull that off. It's just stuff that has to happen in real, in real time, you know, or in real life. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how that came about. But it happens. <laughs> I don't know. It is incredible. It's, there's something very, uh, like I feel like it's something sometimes outside of, me that I'm you hear people say that about writing and things that you feel like like you're a vessel more than you know some people think that they're the people originating it and I feel like I'm just a filter things are going through so I see things a certain way but the things are coming to me I'm not going out and finding them. how did you start because you must have learned to do that yeah I think I just started as like a kid. I think, you know, you find out that you can make adults laugh and it's like, kids don't have any power, right? But when you can make an adult laugh, that's like a really powerful thing for a kid to be able to have. So I think then, you know, whenever I discovered that, that's when I started kind of following it and, and uh, learning about it because I just saw how, uh, how funny people were perceived by adults and I thought like, that's where you want to be. So you learned that. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. What can you remember what types of things made adults laugh when you were younger? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I remember just being quick was like be always having the the right thing to say at the right moment seemed to be the thing. You know, uh, that seemed to be the thing that adults responded really well to is if something happened and you had the the right thing to say, uh, man, that was explosive. You know, if you could if you could nail it on the spot, that was big. And that was really big with my parents and my aunts and uncles, like just having the right thing to say in the moment was really important. So does that mean that you're always listening really closely and like chess going one step ahead? Yeah, well, I do. I don't try to not engage in a conversation no, no. by thinking. Yeah. But yeah, trying to always listen and uh, you know, trying to predict uh, or seeing where an opening is, you know, and uh, jumping in. But uh, yeah, I try to just listen to what's happening and synthesize it. But yeah, I'm always waiting. I'm always waiting for uh, an opening, yeah. and when it comes, I'm overjoyed if I can get there first. So. Yeah, it's but I remember that being like really big around the dinner table or whatever. As if you had the if you were if you were quick, that was the thing. Yeah. So did you? Uh, but are you? Have you got siblings? Mm-hmm. How many? Got two younger brothers. I guess they were the oldest. Wow. Yeah. And uh, both of them are very fine, like very very fine. Are they comics? Nope. No, they're just hilarious. They're just two really really funny You're guys. The oldest child. Yeah. And you're the one that's standing up there. That's really rare. Is it? Mm-hmm. Um, the oldest child. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that. I don't know how that happened. I think my brothers are both funnier than me, uh, but they just don't have the interest in being a stand-up. So they're not. But they're still hilarious. Do you have um, some sense of hope? when you're on the stage. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I do feel like uh, there's something very familiar no matter where you are in the world about being on that stage, Um, especially because everything else can be, any given day, everything can be topsy-turvy and, uh, you know, you've had a really awful day, but there's something very constant about the stage. So, yeah, in a way, it does feel very kind of like home. In that regard. So, you obviously come from quite a big family, or like a family that's a group rather than yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think that it could possibly be that because you were always like listening when you were growing up, that when you're on the stage, it's almost like the audience is your family and you're listening? Because people say all, every audience is different. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like. Uh, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld that said, and I always subscribe to this philosophy that it's when you're doing stand-up, it's not it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue with the audience. So if they don't laugh at something, ignoring it and moving on to the next thing is the worst thing you can do, because then you're just saying this is a monologue and you're wrong, I'm right and just moving through the paces. Uh, So the audience tells you, we like that, we don't like that, uh, keep going in that direction. They'll they'll tell you, every audience, even though all of them are different, will tell you, this is what's working tonight, and this is what's not working. And you can listen to it or not listen to it, that's up to every individual, but yeah. And I do, I really believe that, it's a dialogue and if you want to hear what they're saying, they're more than happy to tell you, so, yeah. So, do you feel fear when you're on stage? Um, I don't... I think the lead-up to going on stage is the more fear-based. But that's... For some comics, say they're fearful on stage, and it's almost like they're fearful of the audience, but you sound to me like you're not at all fearful of the audience, in fact you maybe embrace them. I, yeah, I, I think the fear of the audience, the only time I've ever been afraid of an audience is when there was like somebody in the audience who was violent, right? Which is violent. 
Yeah. You're supposed to be scared then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but if a crowd's just not into the show, or if they're just not gelling as a crowd, or if... Uh, as long as somebody isn't specifically out to ruin the night, then it's fine. Then it's kind of all fine for me. Uh, it's only the times when there's somebody who... I don't know, they're there on a date and they don't want to be shown up or they're too drunk and they just don't know that they're ruining things. And that's that's the only time that I get kind of like, I don't, want, I don't want anybody to get hurt or whatever during a show. Uh, but, yeah, I don't feel like I've ever... I've been in positions where I know that I should have been afraid of the audience, but wasn't and I don't take like a fearless approach to them I just don't think people who are going out to have a good time and laugh are a particularly intimidating type of person no. you know what I mean yeah. like I think I would say a different thing about people who go out to watch maybe like a hockey game you know like that could be a whole different type of mindset but people who go to a comedy club like they are there they want to laugh mm -hmm. you know and if a show's not good, it's actually, I think, as hard on them as it is on the comic because they have to sit there and be uncomfortable with how things aren't going well. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think, I think maybe that generosity is more a reflection of you than well, maybe. the audience. But, but I feel bad because I know like I've had lots of friends come to shows over the years, and if somebody does bad... They're not angry at the comic. They're they're sad that that's what happened because they want everybody to be funny uh, because that's you know that's the ideal circumstance. Every comic that comes to the stage, theoretically, like I say, there's a percentage of people who aren't, but they want to laugh. They want to enjoy the show. So why else would they show up? You know? Yeah. So I mean, it gets tricky when there's a show that's like a discount show or a free show, then it gets, you know, it just could be people who just showed up and maybe they don't care about the show. But on a night when it's people who are at a comedy club and that's kind of the agreement in the room, uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a terrifying group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like generally I'm, I'm pretty at ease with the type of people that would show up at a comedy show. You know, um, you know Bill Hicks? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm so amazed by him, mm -hmm. obviously. But one of the things that I don't really understand is there's audience, my relationship mm -hmm. with things that are funny and things that are unbelievably, incredibly important and matter so much. Mm -hmm. Like that there's an overlap? There obviously is, isn't there? Yeah, I think... Do you understand that? I don't know that I understand it. I certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think like a lot of things, humor is a... Uh, you know, it's a coping mechanism. Right. So yeah. I think if you're processing horrible things mm. through the lens of trying to find the humor in it, I think it does make some pretty unbearable stuff, slightly more bearable. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I think people have such a reverence for guys like Bill Hicks, is because they were able to talk about these like, really awful things. Yeah. But connect it to that part of you that wants to see something good in it or wants to laugh at it. And, it, you know, make it smaller and more manageable yeah. by laughing at it. So maybe... I mean, I don't understand intrinsically how those things are linked, but certainly guys like him had an ability to kind of weave a connection between the two, so, which is impressive. It's very impressive when you see yeah, it done well. it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know how it's done. It's just... It's, just, it's an incredible thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of... It's an incredible thing that I'm glad that there's people who do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, like, I mean, it's tough. It's a tough, that's a tough line to walk, too, because some people, there are just things that they don't want to laugh at because they're too hard to even bring up in a funny context. It's very hard for, that, that 
is a situation where I can understand the comedian being a bit more afraid of the audience because they're taking on something that maybe yeah. is, uh, yeah, or very, you know, too close, yes. right? Yes. Um, it's very hard for a comedian to make really big belly laughs when you're talking about cancer or something like yeah. that. It's doable because some comics have had great success with that, but it is, it's tough. And if you do it really well, the reward is pretty big. The audience is really going to appreciate you for going there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, the comics who do that are pretty fearless. So It's quite a thing. Actually. It is, yeah, I'm absolutely. Humbled by it, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. And when I've seen it done, you know, live in a club or in a theater right in front of me, it's amazing yeah. to be part of that. And just uh, see, yeah, like I say, somebody take a thing that everybody in the room knows is, a, uh, like you say, a taboo, and, and then string it along to the point that it is getting big laughs. It's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Did you think... Um, I'm just going to switch late. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do you think that um, for a comedian to be successful, that they have to fundamentally like people? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because I think I think they have to understand okay. people, but I don't think they have to like them. Because I know a lot of comics that don't like people, and but they get them, they understand them, they know what uh, kind of makes them work. And they're, yeah, they're people that don't hang around with people outside of comedy, you know, but they're great at comedy, so, I mean, that's not the rule of comedians, but I do know comics yeah. that, yeah, they don't like people, and, uh, but they're still really good at what they do, yeah. so, I don't think you have to, necessarily. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not like if you work in customer service or something where you do actually have to like people, you know? Drop description. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, comedian, I don't think you have to like people. Uh, and I don't think you, especially as stand-up comedian, you don't have to work well with other people either. You only have to be funny. Uh, I mean, it makes everybody's life easier if you're nice and uh, easy to work with, but you don't have to be as a stand-up because it, it's just you. It's not like making a film or, you know, writing a song with a band where other people contribute. It's just you. So you can be a horrible person and still be amazing at stand-up comedy. So it's, uh, which is kind of nice. It's kind of nice that the people who, uh, who like people can be really good at stand-up and people who are genuinely kind of uh, happy to be there can be good at it and miserable people can be good at it and it's... You know, it all just boils down to, can you do it on the night? Uh, do you have a point of view? It's I find it very, uh, very inclusive that way, because it doesn't really matter what type of person you are. Can you get to from hello to the end of your set and get some laughs somehow? That's, uh, if yes, then yeah, you can be a stand-up comedian, you know? I mean, I think it's incredible that anyone Really yeah, but uh, yeah, I've just I always enjoy the diversity of the people who who can do it and the ways that they can do it is uh, always impressive to me. So, but how do you um, how do you write your stuff? Um, because I, everything is basically written, isn't it? I don't write like sit down and write. Okay. Um, everything is a notion that I think. They think this is funny, and then I'll take it to the stage and see if it if it does. And if it doesn't, that's fine. It's fine. Like a joke doesn't have to work. I won't be crushed if it doesn't work. Uh, but um, yeah, that's how I write. But that's that's uh, just my own personal way. And so, does that mean you're slightly ad libbing on stage? Uh, slightly. Like, I always have notes. I always bring up notes because there's always stuff that if I don't bring it up, if I don't have it there, I won't remember to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. No. But when you're building material 
or just like you have a specific thing you want to get out, it's nice to have it there. But yeah, a lot of them are just vague notions of like, you know, why, why this, why that. Has anybody else noticed this type of thing? And then see if it's got any legs. And sometimes it just dies on the table and that's it. But sometimes there's enough there to keep going with it. Yeah. But you, I, I don't know. Some comics can write, they'll write a whole joke start to finish. I don't feel like, uh, I don't feel like that's a good use of time because I don't know what's going to work and what's yeah. not, you know? So I throw a lot of stuff out there and see what sticks kind of thing. But it doesn't work for everybody. Just for me, so. yeah. yeah. I don't know um, how many other comics I've spoken to who like that actually. Um, yeah. Is that I, unusual? I don't. Um, no, I mean, I've heard of other people who do it like that. Yeah. Um, like to me, sitting down and being able to just write a joke in full is very. That's very unusual. And, and like a, an ability that I'm very jealous of. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of comics work that way. I wish they worked that way because I think uh, if it would feel more like I'm in control of what I'm, you know, like this is the punchline, I'm going to make the audience come around to it. Uh, but I'm always willing to let the audience <laughs> have a say, you know, if yeah. uh, that is a punchline or that is not a punchline. Yeah. So, yeah. That kind of goes with what you were saying earlier. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's just the way that because uh, I've tried other styles of writing, yeah. and it just they didn't click. So that this is the one that's clicked and worked the most often. So yeah. it's kind of my default. It's, honestly, it's I'm amazed by it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Too, a lot of musicians are also amazed by comedians. Is that right? Yeah. I I think there's always that. Uh, I think there's a reciprocal awe that goes on yeah. between comics and musicians. I think that too. Comics, all the comics I know, you know, are in love with a a musician or a band or uh, something they've seen a musician yeah. do that that you can't necessarily do in comedy. Yeah. And, uh, but there's a lot of overlap. I know a lot of musicians and I've ended up, you know, gigging with musicians and, uh, yeah, lot, and lots of musicians are very funny. That's the other thing. It's like a lot of the musicians I know are very, very dry and funny and, uh, you know, if they didn't play instruments, they would probably also be comedians. You know, like if they didn't have an, a natural ability outside of being funny, I think they, that's probably what they would have ended up doing. So, uh, but yeah, so I think there's always been kind of a, I don't know, a fascination with the other yeah, side. There yeah, there is definitely, I think there's mutual respect. Mm -hmm. I guess you're both, um, both musicians and comedians, you're both having a relationship with an audience which is in front of you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is quite an unusual thing. Yeah, and it's, you know, you're trying to, uh, it's not only in front, being in front of people, you're also trying to express uh, an idea or a thought, and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, there's, and just the type of lifestyle of having to go on the road and do gigs, and it's very similar. Yes. Yeah. And so you read, you know, an autobiography by a band, and it just yeah. rings very true, yeah. so... It's kind of one of those things when you meet a musician, there's already, uh, you kind of already have so many topics covered. Yeah, you don't you know. have to visit them because you know. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. So so then you can have that, yeah, you can kind of jump into the the more advanced yeah. conversation than that, than small talk or whatever. The other thing that um, is really interesting for us is, because um, obviously you're pretty young now, you've got all these years ahead of you. I hope so. Haven't you? Yeah. And um, what does it just come naturally to you? Um. Is it how you think, how you are. Like just will I just keep doing it? Yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of comedy, I think people, uh, they, if they're doing their job, they get funnier as time goes on. Yeah. Um, 
and I think you see it now even with, uh, I don't know if you saw the Joan Rivers documentary that came out. So she, she is now in her 80s? Yeah, late 70s, early 80s, and uh, she is now, I, I uh, was a supporting act for her three years ago, four years ago, and I was blown away by how, uh, like, unbelievably professional she was, and how uh, tenacious she was on stage, like, I, I literally have seen people 40, 50 years younger that don't have the kind of fire in their belly that she is able to muster and like as if out of nowhere because off stage she's sweet and quiet and very demure and then she goes on stage and she's just foul mouthed and uh, just a real you know fire breathing kind of uh, uh, act and so but because she's been diligent all these years you know uh, she's I think she is legitimately funnier now than she was yeah in the 80s or the 70s, and I think that's true for a lot of comedians. Not all of them, I think other comedians just kind of, they stop writing, they stop performing, and it goes away. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, a guy like Louis C.K. is the funniest he's ever been. He's, you know, and he'll get funnier. Um, same with George Carlin. Like, if George Carlin at age 50 was leaps and bounds funnier than George Carlin at age 30. Uh, so, like I say, if the person is still working, and they're still doing it, uh, they should be getting better at it. Um, and I think, you know, as long as they're able to, to work, which is tough because we live in an ageist kind of society, uh, uh, as long as there's people who are willing to, you know, to work them, they, yeah, they're going to get better. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the hope is that you just keep, that you're able to just keep doing it. You know, um, that a lot of people say that comedians have this kind of dark side to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, um, which um, I don't personally really agree with, mm -hmm. but um, it's kind of early days. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think there is, there is and there isn't, you know? Like, I've met people at both ends of that spectrum that are, yeah, incredibly dark and depressed people, and then I've met comedians that are just the happy-go-lucky, optimistic about everything kind of people, so... Do you think the spectrum, the ratio is the same, um, as it is in society, or do you think there is a greater... I think that whenever you're talking about the arts, there's probably, you know, there's probably a tendency towards, I think, create, you know, creative people uh, are, are, can be generally more sensitive, and, and so, maybe, but then, you know, like all the kind of horrible stories when somebody goes and shoots up a movie theater or a bank or whatever, they're not poets or artists, they're, you know, somebody who is working in an office somewhere. So, you know, yeah, I don't know that it's higher... Yeah, maybe, I just think maybe the arts in general have just yeah. a cracked... I would agree with that, Yeah. For sure. But I don't think necessarily in comedy. I think comedy is a weirder environment to stay healthy in because you're working at night and you're working in places that serve alcohol and... Yeah. So yeah, I think like that, you know, like anybody who works night shifts yeah. has a hard time just functioning in regular society, yeah, right? Yeah, I agree, but I don't, that doesn't matter though, does it? Um, no, but I mean it can if you want to have, you know, there's comics that want to have uh, relationships and kids and, you know, that and that's the tough balance when you're, you know, you're going on the road and you're working at night in bars and... Uh, there's a lot of drinking, and yeah, so I think there can be, uh, there can be that ramification, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I haven't found it any higher than in any other group of people I've encountered. Well, I've noticed, I mean, I, that's basically what I think mm -hmm. as well, but the thing that I have noticed is that, um, comics or comedians are 
the good ones are really clever. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, and I have definitely noticed that. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, uh, um, I think that's, yeah, I don't think you would be uh, a dumb person and be wanting to be a comedian. Those, those seem at odds to me. Like, you do have to be, to, to want to do it, I think you just, you would have to be clever. Yeah, like, I don't, I think if you uh, were kind of just not necessarily content with the way you see the world, yeah. but you figured out a way to see the world and it makes you fine with things yeah. to an extent, then you don't need to blow off steam. There's yeah. no dissonance there. Yeah. But for people who think a lot about everything, mm. um, comedy is a good uh, release valve. Yeah. You know, because some people just go, well, that's the way things are. Yeah. You know, and that's those type of people would never do comedy because <laughs> what would they talk about, right? Uh, but yeah, it's the it is the people that are always seeing not what's wrong with the situation, but like why is a thing the way it is? Because it's quite psychologically penetrating, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is. It's like uh, it can become an obsessive thing. But I think it would become an obsessive thing if, if these comedians didn't have a way to get it out, you know, and that that's, this is the way that they get it out, that kind of just uh, curiosity or frustration or whatever it is that is the, the kind of steam for the jokes. Um, yeah, it does help to kind of just um, have an audience to say these things to and also find out that you know, you're not crazy, right? That, yes, other people have thought this same thing. You know what I mean? Uh, that feels very good, and it feels very good for a group of people to all feel that together, right? That, oh, yeah, that isn't a thing that just I do. We all do that. Or I know somebody does that, and so it's not... It, it can be very warm that way, and so I think, like... Uh, but yet, in order to find those things, you always have to be thinking about them. And I think that's, yeah, clever people do that. Yeah. 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 So there must be quite a lot of job satisfaction. There can be, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, it is like anything else. Like, some nights are fantastic, and then some nights are just... Things die, and you can never quite put your finger on why that happened, and... Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know... Like when it works, it's great. When it when it clicks and you you know that you've figured something out or you've been able to prove a type of logic or something to an audience, it's very satisfying, you know. Uh, or if you've been able to pluck something out of the air that everybody was thinking but nobody necessarily had put to words, that's very satisfying. But there, it takes a long time to get to those moments. So when they happen, they're very satisfying. But uh, when when they don't happen. It's very frustrating. <laughs> so, so there, there is both ends of the spectrum to that. But yeah, I mean, the satisfaction could be immense if it goes right. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Greg. Thank you, Rosie. Delightful. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to stop this. I've got to hand this back to you. Thank you. That's brilliant.